This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to answer the question, can you track people sending Bitcoin? And this video is a follow-up to yesterday's video about Bitcoin's privacy problem, which I'll link to in the description notes below. So let's say that John Smith buys one Bitcoin on a KYC exchange, a Know Your Customer Exchange, after having been required to give the exchange all of his personal information. This is why it's called KYC or Know Your Customer. Personal information like his name, address, if he's in the US, social security number, driver's license, a photo of that, a selfie, a face scan, something like this. John then withdraws that one Bitcoin from the KYC exchange to a fresh Bitcoin address that was generated by his hardware wallet. So he's basically withdrawing the money from the exchange and putting it into cold storage, as is a very good idea. Now the KYC exchange will assume that John Smith controls that Bitcoin receive address where he asks them to send his one Bitcoin. And in the EU, John may even be forced to prove that he controls that address by using some software to sign a message. And this is part of the Bitcoin protocol. But as I understand it in the EU, there are already wallets that require you to do this or software programs that require you to do this in order to withdraw your Bitcoin from an exchange. So John may be forced to prove that he controls that address by signing a message. But even if he doesn't, the exchange, the KYC exchange, knows that there's a high probability that he is withdrawing that one Bitcoin to his own address and not withdrawing it to someone else's address, like his father's address or his friend's address. So let's call this Bitcoin receive address, this initial withdrawal address, let's call it address A. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to pretend to watch what's happening on chain. Since the Bitcoin blockchain can be viewed by anyone with a Bitcoin node, are using a public block explorer like this. So this would be an example. This is mempool.space. You never wanna type in your own Bitcoin address in here because the service, even though I believe they're an honest service, they could use your IP address and they can match it with the Bitcoin address that you're putting in. So if you're gonna use mempool.space, don't, don't put in your own address or you can use your own instance of it if, for example, you're using something like start nine. But that's a completely different topic. What I wanted to show you here is how we can see an input address on the left and then three output addresses on the right. And if you compare this first address on the right to the first address on the left, we can see that it's the same Bitcoin address. So what's happening here, what we're seeing happen on chain in this transaction is that Bitcoin, some Bitcoin is being sent to these other two addresses. And then the change, what's left over is going back to this initial address. And then of course, the miners take a transaction fee. So this is how we would do what we're about to do here. I made up the numbers in this example to make it easy, but it's important to note that these sort of things are visible on the Bitcoin blockchain. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel. Click the subscribe button, leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. I really appreciate those. Also share this video with a friend or family member. So let's track this Bitcoin as it moves across the blockchain. At first, that one Bitcoin is sitting at address A, as we said, where it landed after John withdrew it from the KYC exchange. Then we watch on chain and we see that 0.6 Bitcoin has been sent from address A to address B, which has never been used before. Address B is a fresh address. Then we see that 0.3 Bitcoin has been sent from address A to address C, again, a fresh address. And then we see that 0.1 Bitcoin was sent from address A to address D, which has never been used before. And so the resulting balances, if you want to think of them in that way, they're really more like UTXOs. Address A now has zero Bitcoin. This was the initial address that John Smith used to withdraw his Bitcoin from the exchange, but then he proceeded to send it to three new addresses, address B, address C, and address D, which contain the following amounts. Address B has 0.6, address C has 0.3, address D has 0.1. And for the purposes of this example, to make the math easy, I'm excluding Bitcoin miner transaction fees that would normally be deducted, as we saw in this example over here. Question, how much of that original one Bitcoin does John Smith still own? It's actually impossible to tell just looking at the chain analytics for this, since that Bitcoin was sent to three fresh Bitcoin addresses that have never been used before and thus have no history or metadata attached to them. The government and tax authority will still hold John Smith responsible for paying taxes if he ever sells that one Bitcoin for fiat, and in the US he'll have to pay taxes if he spends it as well. This is the current tax law for Bitcoin, but the government will not know where and the exchange won't know really where those 
Bitcoin transactions were sent, that 0.6, that 0.3, and that 0.1. But it's important to note here when you buy from a non, I'm sorry, when you buy from a KYC exchange, there's that permanent record that you made that purchase. And so governments can ask you what happened to the Bitcoin. But on chain here, there's no way to know whether John is sending the Bitcoin to himself to an address that he controls or whether he's spending it, sending it to someone else. So maybe John Smith, address B, C, and D, Maybe John Smith sent that Bitcoin to himself to different address addresses in a different wallet that he controls. Maybe he sent one of them was multi-sig cold storage or all of them were in addresses associated with a multi-sig setup. Maybe John Smith sent some of them to an address or all of them to an address that's controlled by the same original hardware wallet that generated the withdrawal address, address A, that the exchange used to send them that one Bitcoin. So address A, B, C, and D may all be controlled by that original hardware wallet. Or maybe he sent the 0.6 Bitcoin, that's it sitting now at address B. Maybe that address B is actually controlled by a car dealer and John Smith has just bought a car from the car dealer using 0.6 Bitcoin. Maybe the 0.3 Bitcoin at address C is Bitcoin that he sent to a close friend to buy his boat. And maybe the 0.1 Bitcoin, which, city, which is sitting at address D now, he sent to a rancher to buy a cow or a horse or something like this. In this case, the KYC exchange would probably not know whether that 0.6 Bitcoin went to another address controlled by John Smith, if they're looking on chain, or whether he sent it to someone else like a car dealer. Now, if the car dealer had previously done business with that same KYC exchange or a different KYC exchange that sold his data to that initial KYC exchange, and let's say that the car dealer used the same Bitcoin address to receive his Bitcoin from the exchange that he used to accept that 0.6 Bitcoin from John Smith in exchange for a car, in this case, the KYC exchange would be able to extrapolate since the car dealer is reusing the same Bitcoin address. In this case, the KYC exchange would be able to extrapolate with a high degree of probability. And again, this is always a probability game, would be able to extrapolate that John Smith spent 0.6 Bitcoin at that car dealer. The address reuse makes this clear, as does the fact, the common sense fact that 0.6 Bitcoin, it's about, call it $35,000, which is the same order of magnitude to what a new or used car might cost. And again, the exchange already knows that it's a car dealer who controls that Bitcoin address. So the probability becomes, the estimation of the probability becomes quite high at this point. So when people tell you that Bitcoin is not private, there's a lot of nuance involved. Bitcoin addresses are pseudonymous, they're not anonymous. You can look here in the Bitcoin blockchain, you have no idea who controls these addresses, though people who are deep into chain surveillance and have more analytics may be able to associate some of these addresses with certain people or businesses. But Bitcoin addresses in themselves are pseudonymous, not anonymous. And depending how we use them, we can leak more or less personal information. Your personal information, as I said, is never stored on the blockchain itself, but it's rather extrapolated by viewing the movement of Bitcoin on the blockchain and trying to find addresses that have been used before that are associated with personal metadata. In the above example, the car dealer, the friend, and the rancher at addresses B, C, and D can each look on chain and see that their portion of Bitcoin was split off from a UTXO that held one Bitcoin. Again, we're not sure whether the Bitcoin was actually sent to these three people, the car dealer, the friend of the rancher. They could have been sent, uh, John sent it to himself. But in this case, let's assume that it was. And so they can each look on chain and see that John originally controlled an address, at least it looks like on chain, that contained a complete Bitcoin. So there is some leakage of financial privacy here. And so they can extrapolate that John Smith used to or still does control the rest of that Bitcoin apart from what they just spent. Again, they have no way of knowing for sure. They don't know if he sent that 0.1 Bitcoin to a rancher or an address that he controls himself or that 0.3 Bitcoin to a friend to buy a boat. Maybe he still controls the 0.3 Bitcoin. But either way, they know that John has some money here because, or at least used to have some money because he controlled a whole Bitcoin. So that can definitely leak privacy, not to the world. You're not gonna really understand this on chain unless you're one of the actors involved, the rancher, the friend, or the car dealer. So it doesn't leak privacy to the world, but to, but to that particular merchant who's on the receiving end of the payment transaction. Now, if John had coin joined that Bitcoin before sending it on chain, or if he had paid using the Lightning Network instead, it would have been much more difficult or impossible for the car dealer, the friend, or the rancher to know that John Smith was originally sitting on at least one Bitcoin. And if John had bought his one Bitcoin from a non-KYC source that did not 
force him to give up his personal information at the time, then we wouldn't have a situation where the exchange was able to extrapolate that John just bought a car, which the exchange or surveillance company will probably let the tax authority know as well. This government data, this data is, is compiled and fed to governments. It's fed to AI as well as we talked about when we talked about Snowden speech in that previous video. So the only way to get real privacy from the start of holding some Bitcoin in an address is to start with non-KYC. This gives you privacy from the start. If you have KYC Bitcoin, there's no way to erase that original purchase record of having purchased it. The best you can do if you want to get away from KYC Bitcoin in that particular holding is to sell it for fiat and then repurchase it as non-KYC. And after you sell it for fiat, pay any necessary taxes as well. So non-KYC gives you privacy from the start. CoinJoin is another interesting tool that governments don't like. CoinJoin gives you forward spending, sending privacy, and basically brings Bitcoin up to the level of cash, where, for example, when you withdraw cash from the ATM and then go spend it at the farmer's market or somewhere else, the bank has no idea. They know that you withdrew the cash, but they have no idea what you spent it on. And so CoinJoin does give you the sort of forward spending, sending privacy, if done properly. RoboSats is a great service for non-KYC Bitcoin. You can also buy Bitcoin from someone using cash at a Bitcoin meetup or conference. That's a little more risky, but you got to be careful, do it in public. RoboSats is a way of doing it online. And then when it comes to CoinJoin, Join Market is really the last remaining liquid CoinJoin service now that Wasabi and Samurai Whirlpool have basically been forced to shut down by the US government. So that's all that I can say about those services here, but you should definitely do your own research. Give them a try if you need some more hand-holding in this area. And again, this is an advanced area. If you need some more hand-holding, you can check out my site where I've covered these topics as part of a series of live classes, as well as a recorded paid course. And this has all been recorded and is available on the site to subscribers. So I'll put a link to that in the description notes below. How to use Start9 uh, as and set up a node using it. CoinJoin, non-KYC Bitcoin, and then the ultimate guide to Bitcoin loans was the, the August class. I'll be doing a class in September as well, probably uh, a week from Saturday, so keep that in mind. I'll put a link in the description notes below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video, and let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.